All righty. Welcome, everyone, to our workshop for today. Uh, my name is Razan, and today's workshop will be hosted by DIDA professor Noreen Khamisani. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to play a short DIDA video, and then Noreen will start. No great thing, no beautiful invention happened just like that. It happens when we leave our comfort zone and embrace change, creativity, and out of the ordinary. We live in interesting times. We live in a world that's constantly asking questions, that's constantly changing. In a world where blockchain and robots will be the norm, where 85% of tomorrow's jobs don't exist yet. Where being multi-skilled is not just celebrated, but essential. At Dubai Institute of Design and Innovation, we believe that we need to prepare you for the future, to teach you skills that will power your tomorrow. Today, design matters more than ever. But how can design help, you may ask? We combine disciplines so you become well-rounded. From product design, multimedia design, fashion design, strategic design management, it's where you will learn how to merge different design disciplines. Presenting a four-year Bachelor of Design degree in collaboration with MIT and Parsons New School of Design, DIDI, not just another design university. All right, Noreen, over to you. All right, hello everyone. Let me start my video. Hello. Okay, so thank you everyone uh, for joining us today for this workshop. Um, I'm just gonna get the PowerPoint up here so you can see what we are exploring today. All right. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about what a t-shirt can teach us. Um, I am the lecturer in fashion design at DIDI so this is what I love to talk about um, and today you get a little bit of a taster of uh, what we do within the fashion design concentration at DIDI. Oh, now let me find the right button. All right, um, so today what we're going to be exploring is what we can learn from the humble t-shirt. Um, now I'm sure all of you have seen a t-shirt, I'm sure all of you own many t-shirts um, and I think that's why a t-shirt is a really interesting starting point for our discussion today. Um, you know, it's, it's what we think about as a kind of uh, ubiquitous item um, in that, you know, everyone wears t-shirts um, at some point in their life, uh, all over the world um, and hopefully you might actually have a t-shirt with you today um, that you can sort of have a look at so you can kind of be connecting what we talk about today um, with the real kind of item in front of you. Uh, you might even be you know wearing a t-shirt today. Um, so it's a really great kind of uh, starting point for this kind of discussion where we can start to learn a little bit about the fashion industry um, we can also learn about, you know, what are t-shirts actually made from, uh, a little bit about the history of the t-shirt. So we're going to be touching a little bit on the history of fashion in connection to the t-shirt. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about design activism and the role of the t-shirt within that. And so within all of the things, these things, um, as I said, these are all kind of uh, tasters, I guess, of, um, of what we do uh, when we learn about fashion design. Um, so just before we um, actually get kind of, you know, into our discussion and into our exploration today, are there any initial questions? Anyone kind of want to ask anything before I kick off or should I just carry on? No? 
All right, I'd just like to create the space just in case. Um, and feel free if you think of any questions as we go along, um, you can always pop them in the chat um, so that, you know, as you're thinking of the question, you can always write it in the chat at any point and then I'll make sure to have a look at that at the end. Um, and there'll also be a space at the end of today's session um, to get through any questions. All right, let's keep going then. So. Let's start with um, the t-shirt that you hopefully have in front of you. Um, so if you get hold of a t-shirt, um, I've actually got one of my husband's t-shirts here today. Um, maybe you can have a little look at a t-shirt that, yeah, that you're wearing or maybe one that's in the house. Maybe you can just go and grab one out of your wardrobe if you don't have one with you right at the computer. Um, but this is something I really encourage my students to do. Um, because I think there's a lot that we can learn from the clothes in our wardrobes. As I said, it, it, it can teach us about the, the industry as a whole, it can teach us about materials and fibers, can teach us about construction and how garments are made, and it can also teach us about the kind of social aspects and the kind of meanings of these garments. Okay, so hopefully by now everyone has a t-shirt. And um, what I want you to do is become a little bit of a detective, a little bit of a kind of uh, investigator to start with. And I want you to have a look at your t-shirt and see if you can find out what your t-shirt is made of. So um, usually in the inside left-hand side seam, you'll find what's known as a care label, right? Um, so this is where you have usually some information about um, what your t-shirt is made of. So um, on my one here, I've actually got a t-shirt that's made of 100% organic cotton. Probably can't see that in stream, but anyway, that's the care label. Um, so I can say, okay, I know this t-shirt is made of organic cotton. And then I wonder if you might know a little bit about when your t-shirt is made. Now, okay, we're not gonna know really specifically, but I know that I bought this t-shirt for my husband um, about five years ago. So I think the t-shirt was made between five to six years ago. I'm just making an educated guess. Um, and then where was it made? Again, that we would come back to our care label for. And the care label here um, says this uh, was made in India. Now, what I'd like you to do is when you've done your little investigation of your t-shirt, I'd like you to just write in the chat what you know about the t-shirt that you have, because I'd like to have um, a little look at just us as a group today, um, this information, and it's kind of the starting point for a little discussion and exploration. Um, so hopefully you can all write in the chat. Yes, and then we've got a few notes in the chat. Brilliant, we already have some people adding in this information. Great. Okay, so we've already got two t-shirts that are made of 100% cotton. Great. And the majority of t-shirts, uh, you know, usually are are made of cotton, but they can also be made of other fibers. Ah, we've just had another person in the chat, right? They've got a polyester cotton blend. Um, that's also very, very common. And you can also have t-shirts made of linen, um, you can have t-shirts made of viscose, um, silk, um, tencel, which is a type of viscose you might also see. Um, as I mean, there are so many fibres out there and lots of new fibres um, coming through. Um, Great. And has everyone been able to find the care label? The, the other thing, actually, the other point, um, and, and this is, again, something that's about the fashion industry and in that it's not always um, the same. You know, different fashion companies choose to put their information on their garments in different ways. Um, so you might have actually a printed label that might be in the back neck of the garment and it might be printed on there what it's made of or where it was made. Um, some of these fashion companies do that. And depending on where uh, your garment is made and what the kind of laws are there, um, they may or may not even give all this information. Um, in a lot of countries, uh, by law, you have to say where it's made and what fiber it's made of, um, but not everywhere. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, we have some polyester t-shirts. We have quite a lot of cotton t-shirts, which is kind of what I was expecting, but you know, I like to just make sure. We have a lot of things made in, uh, well, we've got Bangladesh, Turkey, Vietnam, India, 
And these are all the really big manufacturing countries. So just by even doing this really, really small exercise um, together just now, I just want to draw your attention to actually how much we can observe about the fashion industry from this. So, okay, we know here from this little survey that we've done among our little group that a lot of these t-shirts are made of cotton predominantly, okay? And um, cotton and polyester are the two fibers that the fashion industry is most uh, dependent on. Those are the two fibers that we utilize most for the majority of our garments. So beyond t-shirts, the majority of the garments that you and I would wear um, are usually made with cotton and, and polyester. And we can see that within our little t-shirt survey, the majority of these are made from cotton. And then um, in terms of manufacturing countries, um, a lot of manufacturing is done in India, in Vietnam, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, of course. And these are all the countries that are coming up here in the chat. Um, Indonesia. <laughs> um, in terms of your question there, um, Amrita, uh, it doesn't have to be a plain t-shirt. Um, just any kind of t-shirt, because of course, uh, you know, t-shirts can have, have prints on them, they could have embroidery on them. Um, yeah, so that's whatever you have. It, it's just, um, it's really just a starting point to, to get us thinking about what are the kind of key facts that we can find out just by looking at the garment right in front of us. Um, you're not going to be drawing on your t-shirt today, no. We are going to do a little bit of a design activity later, but it's going to be done virtually on a screen. So you're not going to damage any of the items that you have in front of you. Um, I mean, unless you really want to. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> impinge on your creativity. Um, okay, so we have another one there that's cotton and polyester. Um, so it's actually quite unusual. I can see that uh, one person's t-shirt right at the beginning um, was actually made in Germany. Um, so that's great, um, but that is kind of unusual, um, and I wasn't expecting that within our little ex exploration this morning, but um, of course, um, European countries and the US um, used to do a lot of manufacturing, um, but a lot of that manufacturing moved abroad, um, simply because it was cheaper to produce abroad. Um, but of course, uh, as things always come full circle in the world, um, you know, people are now coming back and thinking more about local production. Um, and so again, we can really start thinking about how the fashion industry and this kind of humble t-shirt, you know, it's, um, it's a global industry and it has impacts globally. So whether we're thinking about where they're made, where you bought it, how long ago you bought it, you know, um, it's a very uh, it's a very rich topic for exploration. Now it looks like a lot of you don't know how long you've had these t-shirts, or, um, or maybe you just forgot to answer that question. But I am curious about when, because this is another really interesting topic: is to really think about how long are we wearing our garments and how long are we keeping them. Um, let's see, I've got some more answers here. I think. Um, okay, interesting question here. Uh, do fast fashion brands like H&M and Zara disclose truthfully the use of their fabric? Um, you know what? I, I can't really answer for either of those brands. Um, you would need to really look at their, uh, look at their websites and pose that question to them is what I would encourage you to do. And that's kind of one of the topics that we're going to explore today and that we're going to be um, discussing is, you know, the information that we get um, about the garments uh, that we own and how we can ask more questions. Um, because we can all as individuals, especially, you know, um, now I think that brands are really used to people asking them questions. Um, and it's really interesting to pose those questions directly and find out. But yes, the, especially really big brands like H&M and Zara, they do have extremely sophisticated, um, you know, uh, technology in place to monitor where, where their fibers are coming from, where their fibers are processed and where their garments are made. Um, and there are now really interesting projects going on to double check the transparency 
of these uh, of this information. Um, and so most brands would have um, independent um, bodies that come in and double check on that information, double check on the factories, double check on the supply chains. And that's also where we are starting to see certifications come in. Um, and so uh, another organization I'm going to tell you about a bit later, which is called Fashion Revolution, but they're actually a really useful organization um, in terms of checking on these brands and reporting every year. Um, okay, so a few people have answered my question about how long they've had their t-shirts. So most people, some people have sort of had it a couple of months, one to two years, three to four years. So three to four years seems to be kind of the longest. Um, which is actually quite interesting as well. Um, because, you know, especially when we're, you know, thinking about this idea of kind of fast fashion. Um, and I do feel that usually when I'm teaching now, students are much more aware of uh, the issues of fast fashion. Um, but due to the fast fashion industry, uh, the average length um, or the average lifetime, let's say, uh, for a garment um, is about 3.3 years. Um, which is actually not very long. Uh, I don't think, I don't know what you guys think, but I don't think three and a half, uh, 3.3 years is that long to keep a t-shirt. I mean, especially something as classic as a t-shirt, right? This is something that doesn't really go in and out of fashion. Um, you know, a, a t-shirt is a t-shirt is a t-shirt, I think. I mean, you might make slight changes to the material, uh, to the cut, maybe slight changes to the neckline, but, you know, um, really t-shirts are things that we should be able to keep for quite a long time. Um, oh, okay. So someone thought I was asking about how long you've had your t-shirt. Um, you've had it for about a month, but anyway, you know, honestly, please, uh, there's no kind of, um, right or wrong with any of these questions or, or any of the sort of, uh, tasks or questions I pose today. It's really just a starting point for a discussion and hopefully to inspire you to, um, start doing your own little investigations and asking your questions. Um, and I don't know how many of you normally look at care labels and, and look at what your garments are made of, but I really encourage you to do that, you know, when you're, when you're out shopping and when you're thinking about making a new purchase, you know, um, start thinking a bit more about, okay, hang on, what is this actually made of? Let me have a look at that care label and where is it made? And, and does that make a difference um, to my decision? Um, I've just seen someone else writing in the chat here, had the t-shirt for four years, but my brother used it before me for two years, so a total of six years. So um, that's, that's brilliant. I, I love to hear stories like that um, because actually I think this is uh, one of the key things we need to think about for the future of fashion is using garments for longer um, and also the potential for sharing them is really exciting. Um, <laughs> okay. So this is great. And I think, um, you know, it's really nice to see that uh, you guys, you know, are, are starting to, yeah, to think a bit more now. I can see um, some of the messages coming through. So that's great. All right. So let's come back to um, the presentation um, for today. And, you know, we've started uh, getting our kind of brains going, and we've, you know, investigated our little t-shirts. Um, so now let's move on and think about, okay, what is actually in this t-shirt? All right. So, um, I wonder if you guys have seen this kind of image before. Um, this is the cotton plant, um, it's often referred to as the cotton bowl. And this is, um, where our lovely cotton fiber, um, grows in a field. Um, and the majority of the t-shirts uh, that we've observed within our group today were made of cotton. So I'm going to talk about cotton um, specifically. Um, and this is really where, you know, the life of a t-shirt begins is in these cotton fields. Now, cotton is grown around the world. Um, very commonly, it's grown in India, uh, in the US, um, Turkey. These kinds of countries have the right climates um, and grow cotton in really large quantities. Um, and as we've seen, the majority of our t-shirts are made of 100% cotton. Now, cotton as a word refers to, really specifically within this, to the actual fibre. And the fibres are the tiny, tiny, little, little, little pieces um, 
that comes from the plant that are the very starting point for our fabrics. Um, and the great thing about cotton is that it's very breathable, it's very comfortable to wear, um, it washes really easily and it also takes on dyes very easily. Um, and these are some of the main reasons why people utilise cotton specifically for making t-shirts. Um, there are certainly many issues with growing cotton, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but let's just think about the cotton. So we have a field full of cotton. Uh, the farmer has grown this, has nurtured it, watered it, uh, probably used lots of insecticides and pesticides, unfortunately, to protect um, the plant. And then it grows and then it's going to be harvested. And once it's harvested, it needs to go through quite a lot of processing. Um, so here we can see uh, the cotton balls are being put into a machine which is called a gin. Um, and this processing is called ginning. Um, and now it's done mechanically. It's all done by a machine predominantly. Uh, obviously, historically, this was all very much handwork. Um, but within this process, we're basically separating um, the cotton fibre from what the seeds and also what they call the chaff, which is all the kind of other stuff that um, is around the cotton ball and part of the plant. Um, and it utilizes these uh, powered cleaning cylinders um, that are basically cleaning um, and separating the fibers um, so that we can actually move into processing it. Um, and once we've done this ginning process, we can then move on to what we call carding. Um, now, carding is actually where once we've got our fibres, what we need to do is get those fibres really beautifully aligned. Um, so they all need to be neatened up and aligned because they're all very, very short fibres. And if they're all in a mess and all over the place, then we can't actually start to think about how to utilise that and make it into a fabric. So the carding process is actually getting all that, um, all those little, little short fibers all aligned um, and into, um, into the sort of uh, the preparation that it can then go into the next process, um, which is actually spinning it into a yarn. And this is really crucial because if we don't um if we don't get those really nicely aligned fibers we're not going to get a really smooth finished yarn which we need to be able to make these really smooth nice cotton fabrics and you know cotton t-shirts are really lovely and soft and they can also be washed really easily and washed a lot and they can still stay really nice and that is all coming down to this processing and so then we are spinning the yarn and um and then the yarn is going onto these spools. And then we move into our next part of the process, which is here, which is actually knitting, knitting the yarn into a fabric. Now, um, there's lots of different kinds of knitting machines and it's a different type of knitting to what you might be um, familiar with, uh, which is, you know, like with your knitting needles and, uh, and, and knitting, for example, um, some wool. Um, it's similar, but of course it's been made mechanically by a machine at this point. Um, so I'm just seeing a few questions come in, sorry. So let me have a quick look here. So historically, all this kind of processing was done by hand. And of course, in some regions, um, you know, it still might be being done by hand. Um, but when we're talking about, you know, T-shirts specifically uh, that are, you know, made commercially and at scale, it would all be being done by a machine. Um, but some of the picking might still be being done by hand. Um, yes, and the machine does all the separation. Ah, interesting question here. Um, I hope you don't mind. I know you've asked me privately, but I hope you don't mind me uh, answering it to everyone because everyone might be thinking about this. Um, don't they weave it too, along with knitting? Now, 
I wasn't going to sort of get into this uh, today because it adds another complexity, but I'm very happy to answer the question very briefly um, because I'm really happy to see you guys asking questions and that you're engaged. So um, there are lots of different ways of actually making fabric. Now, because we're talking, because we're using sort of a t-shirt as you know our sort of lens and our um, sort of journey into this, um, we're talking about knitting because uh, cotton jersey t-shirts um, like these are made of knitted fabric and that's why they have this sort of gentle kind of stretch and movement to them. Um, but you can of course uh, weave fabrics with cotton as well or, and with any fibres, um, but weaving just creates a different kind of fabric. Um, usually woven fabrics are not um, stretchy in the same way although you can weave fabrics and add in some elastane which does create stretch um, but that's slightly different um, because with knitting you're actually getting the stretch from the construction of the fabric um, so that stretch doesn't so you don't need any elastane or, or anything added um, it's literally the way that those yarns are interlocking through the knitting process that is giving you a natural kind of breathability as well as a kind of um, stretch but knitting is just one of many ways that we can construct fabric and again if you would like to learn more then come and join me in the fashion concentration um, and um, we'll be able to explore in much more depth all the different ways in which um, fabrics are made um, because it's really crucial uh, for any fashion designer uh, to understand um, you know what they're using within their designs um, so once we have our knitted fabric um, we can think about cutting out the shapes that we need to make our t-shirts. So normally you would be cutting your neckline, you'd be cutting a curve for your armhole. Um, and then you would sew those pieces together um, to make our t-shirt. And then you add at the end what we refer to as the trims. So that might be, you know, adding um, the back neck label. Um, sometimes you might be adding, you know, some other labels um, decoratively, you might be adding uh, embroidery. And of course you might even be printing these t-shirts. Um, and this is kind of the end of our sort of very basic, uh, but introduction to how, how a t-shirt is made. Um, any other questions about how a t-shirt is made before I move on? Okay, all right. Well, yeah, please do everyone. I really enjoy seeing your questions because then um, I know I'm telling you the things you want to know. So go ahead and, and keep asking questions as we move through. All right, so we now have a bit of an idea of uh, what a t-shirt is made of and roughly how it's made. So now let's think a little bit about the history, uh, the provenance, you know, um, what, um, what's the history of this t-shirt? Um, so it's actually not that easy to find uh, really authentic and really uh, strong visuals of historical t-shirts. Um, so I've done my best here. Um, but essentially the most important thing I think to understand as a starting point is that the t-shirt actually started as a men's undergarment. And this is around the mid sort of 19th century. Um, and it's actually initially used um, a lot by uh, the US Navy and they were issued uh, to be worn underneath uniforms, um, but soon they were proved to be so comfortable, especially in kind of hot weather that it became really standard issue. Um, but it really wasn't seen as kind of um, something that you would wear uh, on its own very commonly. I mean, unless you were, it was specifically, it was very functional, it was very much a kind of work thing. And the idea was that it was something you would wear, I mean, um, underneath um, a shirt. And then you can see here in this old advert um, for a t-shirt where it talks about it being, you know, it's, well, it says it's an undershirt, it's an outer shirt. Um, but you can see here that it's really an undershirt to wear underneath shirts, uh, you know, with a classic collar. Um, but then it could be used for things like um, camping or sports. Um, and so it was a very kind of, it was very much kind of function based, let's say. Um, and then we see this kind of evolution then of these t-shirts being decorated. Um, now, 
as often is the case with with history, uh, you know, people, different people claim uh, to take ownership for the first ever printed T-shirt. Um, and so there's different people that kind of claim this. Some people say it was in 1939 when the Wizard of Oz film um, came out that they made these first printed T-shirts. Um, but the only kind of accessible one in terms of um, it, it kind of imagery uh, is this photo here, uh, which is from a school um, from 1942. Um, this was actually featured on the cover of Life magazine. So we definitely know that uh, you know around 90, the late 1930s, early 1940s is when um, people started actually printing on T-shirts, and of course now. Printed t-shirts are, again, very common. Uh, they're often on trend. We see them everywhere. So, I mean, I think it's really interesting that it's, it's a relatively, still a relatively new design in that it's, you know, here it is from 1942. Um, and this is uh, around the time that we start to actually move into thinking about t-shirts as something more symbolic, as something that can start to tell a story. Um, and yes, uh, with regards to the question that's just come up in the chat, initially t-shirts were specifically a men's garment. Yeah, they were a men's functional garment, um, to start with. A very similar in a way to sort of denim jeans. Again, that was, it, denim jeans started off as something very much, uh, aimed at men, very, very functional. Um, and actually both t-shirts and jeans in a way have a very similar history in that their meaning, um, and the sort of mode of communication that they offer us, um, has evolved significantly. Um, so I would say that, um, the real kind of breakthrough in the sort of, uh, history of the white t-shirt started around the 1950s. And this is when, you have these very famous kind of Hollywood icons um, like Marlon Brando um, and James Dean uh, wearing white t-shirts and not wearing them as an undergarment, actually wearing it as the whole garment, the whole look. So here on one side, you can see the poster from A Streetcar Named Desire. Um, and here we see uh, James Dean um, in a photo from Rebel Without a Cause. And so this kind of endorsement um, is really, well, was, and I mean, still is really powerful, right? Celebrity endorsement uh, makes things happen. Um, and what happened when uh, these two stars and these two really iconic films utilize these white t-shirts as kind of part of this look for these very kind of rebellious characters, this is when the t-shirt really becomes associated with, um, with rebellion, um, with kind of cu uh, counterculture, uh, sort of questioning the status quo, crash, questioning the establishment um, becomes a really uh, big connection with something so simple, which is, you know, a t-shirt. Um, but it is this whole historical context that has created this because t-shirts were actually uh, designed to be, say, undergarments. Um, it became a kind of political statement to wear this undergarment as your main garment. And then this uh, association uh, continues into the 70s, uh, where we see t-shirts become a really big part of the punk movement. Um, so here is Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren. Um, now, again, as with all history, uh, lots of people claim to uh, have started the punk movement. Um, I don't know if we can ever find out exactly who started it, but we do know that uh, Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood were there at the beginning of the punk movement and they were a big part of it. Um, and I really love this quote um, from Vivian Westwood. Um, and she says that the shape of a t-shirt is so simple and beautiful. You are aware of the cloth, of the body, but also of an image. It is a canvas. And I think this is something that's really key uh, to the history of the t-shirt, um, but particularly to this time um, and the punk movement. This is exactly how Vivian Westwood used the t-shirt. She used it as a canvas to communicate, to tell a story. Um, and if we have a look at some of these examples, um, of these punk, I mean, okay, one of them technically is a top, but 
<laughs> nevertheless again it's very difficult to find these original pictures so um this is how Vivian Westwood saw the t-shirt. She saw it as a canvas um, to tell a story about questioning the status quo, offering an alternative. Um, and here we can see these t-shirts as, as a canvas for various artwork that was often used on album covers by punk bands. And then that same artwork was beginning to be put on t-shirts. Um, Okay, uh, yes, that is the Queen of England on the t-shirt. Um, because at this time in the 70s, um, young people were very unhappy in the UK. Um, they felt that they had uh, no hope. They felt that the establishment within the UK was holding them back um, and not giving them the opportunities that they needed to be able to create a better life for them. And so artists at the time and, and the punks, they kind of used this image of the Queen uh, with a safety pin going through her lip um, as a symbol um, of questioning the status quo, of questioning the way that things had always been done. Um, they were pushing boundaries um, because they wanted change. And I think youth culture is often about that. Um, and, you know, this was just the beginning. Uh, although the, the punk movement wasn't around for very long, um, it stayed very influential. And, you know, you often see these kind of punk motifs coming back into fashion in different ways over time. Okay, so um, now we're going to move on to thinking about the slogan t-shirt and the creation of that. Um, so I'm sure all of you are familiar with slogan t-shirts, right? I mean, they've been everywhere recently. Um, and uh, again, uh, it's difficult to exactly pin it down and different people take credit for it. Um, but I'm quite comfortable with saying that Catherine Hamnett was definitely one of the very first designers, if not to invent the slogan t-shirt, but certainly to use it um, to its fullest potential. And she became very, very well known in the 1980s um, for using t-shirts as a canvas to ask questions um, through these slogans. Um, so, for example, um, her Choose Life slogan t-shirt was worn by George Michael on top of the Pops. Um, she also famously wore a t-shirt wearing a slogan um, to meet Margaret Thatcher in 1984. Um, and she was really specifically through her t-shirt um, asking about nuclear missiles um, that were being um, moved across UK soil. And here you can see some examples of her t-shirts. Um, you know, to say stop acid rain, um, to raise awareness around education. And this is something that she hasn't stopped doing. So here there's some more recent um, versions of her slogan t-shirts. And this is Catherine Hamnett herself modeling those t-shirts. Um, and she's moved on from just asking questions about kind of uh, politics in the world at large um, to actually asking some really important questions about the fashion industry. So here you can see one of her really uh, famous t-shirts, no more fashion victims, and also make trade fair. So here, Catherine Hamnett is a real pioneer within the fashion industry in that she was one of the first people to start to ask some really serious questions about the way that we make garments and what we make them from. And a lot of her focus was actually on the production of cotton. Um, so it's a very long quote, um, but I think it's really important and I think it's really nice to bring her voice in. So bear with me. I've tried to break it down and we'll explore it a little bit slowly. Um, so this is Catherine Hamnett talking about her work. So in 1989, I started researching into the impact of the clothing and textile industry socially and environmentally. And I discovered it was a living nightmare in all areas. So this was, you know, um, this was uh, something that everyone should be doing in a way. Everyone should be asking these questions. But before Catherine Hammond, I'd say not many designers were asking this question, these questions. Um, and she didn't just ask these questions, she actually did her own investigation. 
And what she found was that tens of thousands of farmers were and still are dying of pesticide poisoning in cotton agriculture. Millions of the same farmers were on the verge of, or on the edge of starvation and some were actually starving, living in conditions worse than slavery and being forced to borrow money to buy the chemicals that kill them. Um, and then finally, she found that at least 250,000 cotton farmers had committed suicide allegedly because of pesticide debt um, in this particular region in India, and this is across 10 years. Um, now, you know, of course, this doesn't happen in all cotton farming, but it happens enough for it to be significant and for there to be a need for a change. And Catherine Hamnett did all this research, uncovered these issues. Um, she then went to her suppliers with this information and said, well, look, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to work in this way. I don't want to cause harm to the people that are growing the fibers or making the fabrics or making my garments. Um, now at this time uh, in the nineties, um, and all suppliers just said, well, you know, everyone else is fine with it. No one else is asking questions. Why, why is it so different for you? And so it actually took her a really long time uh, to be able to make these changes in her business because she had to literally speak to hundreds of suppliers to try and find someone willing to make this change. And so it was kind of in the 90s that we started to see a little bit of organic cotton being produced. Um, but the challenge actually is that it's not a completely quick process to transform. So if you have a field of cotton that is conventionally grown with pesticides and insecticides, um, it takes actually three to five years to convert that field from conventional to organic. Um, and this also means the farmers have to source their seeds differently because as you can see um, from the research that Catherine Hamlet did, um, these farmers were, well, are essentially forced, when they buy their conventional cotton seed, they are forced to buy the pesticides and insecticides to go with them, which is when later on, if the cotton prices fluctuate, these farmers were ending up into, into debt because those insecticides and pesticides are so expensive. Um, but, you know, and there are, of course, other ways of doing things. Um, and this is what I want us to start thinking about. Um, we've looked at kind of the challenges here. And so, of course, this research um, that Catherine Hamlet began is really part of a much bigger kind of discussion um, around sustainability. Um, now, there's lots of these different kinds of diagrams around. Um, this is one of the most simple ones I could find, again, for the purpose of today to just be planting some seeds and get us thinking about this. So when we're thinking about sustainability, one way we can look at it is as having kind of three key kind of spheres that have an impact and that need to be considered. Um, so of course, when we're talking about um, cotton actual growing and farming, we're in the environmental sphere, right? So we're thinking about our natural resources. Um, when we start thinking about the way that those farmers are treated or, you know, the way that even people sewing our garments might be treated, um, we're moving into the social sphere. Um, and then when we start thinking about how much we pay those cotton farmers for their cotton or how much we pay people um, for processing um, and making our cotton, then we're in the economic sphere. So then we start to see that actually these three different considerations, our environmental, our social and economic, are completely connected when we actually want to start moving into working in a sustainable way. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit on some of the challenges um, of actually thinking about social sustainability. And this is a really nice um, page from a fanzine produced by Fashion Revolution. I don't know if anyone's heard of Fashion Revolution. Um, it's a not-for-profit global um, movement and it's actually, um, you know, as it's, it's all over the world. So there's a, a Fashion Revolution in the UK, there's a Fashion Revolution in France, there is actually a Fashion Revolution here in the UAE, um, there's Fashion Revolution in India, um, all over the world it's been set up 
Um, and the whole idea of fashion revolution is to ask these tough questions of the fashion industry and to shine a spotlight on the, it's particularly the social issues, although as we've just discussed, um, you know, social sustainability issues are not separate from the economic or the environmental, they all have to come together. But their focus is very much on pushing for transparency in the fashion supply chain. Now, Fashion Revolution was actually set up to commemorate the Rana Plaza disaster in Bangladesh. Again, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with what happened. Um, it's actually the, um, the biggest industrial disaster in recent history. Um, the Rana Plaza was um, a factory that was producing uh, fashion garments um, for companies all over the world. And the building collapsed and it killed over a thousand people. Um, and so the whole idea of fashion revolution actually came from um, wanting to make sure that that never ever happened again. And so in 2013, which was the first anniversary of the Rana Plaza disaster, um, they created Fashion Revolution Day and they held events all over the world um, to make sure that people would never forget and to also encourage all of us um, to start asking more questions uh, of, about fashion supply chains and whether you ask brands um, or whether you ask you know, people in shops that you're buying from, is to start asking these questions. And so they have this very famous hashtag, which is who made my clothes. And they've also now moved into um, producing um, lots of different kinds of resources and activities. And they also produce these really cool fanzines. Um, I'm going to give you a link at the end of um, today's session so that you can explore a little bit further. So let's have a look at this one page from this fanzine um, because very helpfully it is looking at a t-shirt very specifically. And to understand how um, how we end up with the t-shirts in the shop and how we end up paying the price we pay um, and where does you know where does that price come from right so here we have this example of a 29 euro shirt and so on the left hand side we can see this is the typical supply chain typical t-shirt so we can see the retail markup is the highest that's at 17 euro so that is what the shop is making when they sell you that t-shirt. And then we can start working our way down and we can see that there's a brand margin. So the brand is making another amount there. Then we have, you know, an agent fee. We have transportation because often our garments are made abroad, right? As we saw at the beginning, you know, if your garment is being made in China or in India, um, but you're buying it in the US, it has to be transported. Um, and then that garment's being made in a factory, so then the factory has to make some money. Um, then there are the, the manufacturing costs. And so within the manufacturing costs, um, this is where we're thinking about, you know, the actual materials. So that cotton fiber, the processing of that cotton fiber, the spinning of it, and then the knitting of that into a fabric as we've explored. And then the actual manufacturing overhead. So, you know, the cost of running that factory, powering it. And then right at the bottom, right at the bottom, 18 cents is the labor. So out of a 29 euro t-shirt, the person that actually sewed that t-shirt together is getting 18 cents per t-shirt. Now, on the right hand side, Fashion Revolution is asking, if garment workers were paid a living wage, how much more would you pay for the same t-shirt? Um, now, I think this is the really important question to ask because um, if you do go and do some more investigating yourself, you might find that what a lot of brands say on their websites is that they pay the minimum wage in the country where they manufacture. And so you might think, okay, I mean, you know, fair enough. Like, we can't all be experts on fashion supply chains. Why should we be, right? You might just want to buy a t-shirt. Um, and so we go, okay, they pay the minimum wage in that country. That, that sounds fine. But this is the big problem, is that in many countries, the minimum wage is not equivalent to a living wage. And so particularly um, in a country like Bangladesh, um, the minimum wage means that you have to have about four people in a family working to be able to support that family. Um, 
And so this is why um, many organizations, including Fashion Revolution, um, are really pushing for the fashion industry to ensure a living wage for the people that sew their garments. And so here in this infographic, they're showing us that if you pay a living wage for the labor, a living wage to the person that is sewing up that t-shirt, that would be equivalent to 45 cents. All right. And so that means that the final t-shirt would have to cost one euro 57 cents more. Um, and so you really start to see how accessible this kind of change is, you know, so if we really want to change a, a supply chain, I mean, again, this is just a t-shirt. So of course it's something very simple, but it's a way of starting to think about how possible it is um, to make these small changes. I mean, I think most of us would happily pay um, one euro fifty um, more for a t-shirt um, if we knew that the person making that t-shirt was going to be paid a living wage. Um, now, the other issue that we sort of touched upon um, at the beginning with uh, with Catherine Hamlet's work um, is the actual cotton fiber. So we looked at how cotton is processed and how it's made. Um, and now what I wanna just talk about a little bit is the difference between a conventional cotton and an organic cotton. Because this is again, one of the easiest switches that we can make. So rather than having conventional cotton, we can use organic cotton. And this creates a really, um, a really interesting change because with conventional cotton, as I mentioned before, we have to use a lot of insecticides and pesticides. And in fact, more chemical pesticides are used for cotton growing than any other crop. Um, cotton actually accounts for 16% of global insecticide releases. Um, and unfortunately, the cotton plant is very vulnerable. So it, it needs protection from pests. And that's why these, um, these insecticides and pesticides are used. Um, but if we switch to organic cotton farming, um, we can use uh, more natural methods. It's basically going back to the old fashioned way of growing cotton before we had all these chemicals. And it's a really important switch. If we actually think about that 60% of the world's cotton is used for clothing, I mean, if we can change that 60% of cotton to be organic rather than um, conventional, we can make a really big impact in terms of removing these insecticides and chemicals from our production. Um, so if we switch to an organic process, we allow farmers um, to save seeds from one season to the next. That means they don't have to buy them every time. This, you know, helps them from an economic perspective, um, freeing them, you know. Um, it also means that the soil is looked after properly. Um, when you cover the soil in chemicals, you're depleting its nutrients and then you need to move crops around. You can't keep growing that crop in the same place. Um, but through organic farming, um, we're actually nurturing the soil. Um, also with organic farming, um, because there aren't all these insecticides and pesticides, the farmers can also grow their own food alongside their cotton crop. And then this is also really important for biodiversity. Um, so there are huge, huge impacts um, that can be, uh, that can go way beyond, you know, just even those farmers, we can see huge impacts for, for the planet, but we can also see impacts for us. As, as consumers. So for example, we're now kind of coming back to the social sphere a little bit, um, if we look at what happens within a factory. So within a factory, if we're producing organic cotton t-shirts, um, these factories are regularly inspected um, by the people that would give them the certification that says they're organic, okay? So the certification body will be going in and checking on that factory, they'll be making sure there's no forced labor and that there's no child labor. Um, and this all just comes from this switch from conventional uh, to organic. In a conventional factory, there may be no mandatory checks. Um, you know, these factories are just producing as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible. They're not worried about who makes those clothes or what conditions they're working in. 
Um, and then when we actually think about ourselves as consumers, now, you know, when you put a, any kind of fabric on your skin, you know, when you're wearing a t-shirt, um, you know, your skin can absorb chemicals from the garments you wear. And I think people don't often think about that, but actually um, wearing an organic cotton t-shirt is actually better for you um, because there's no residues allowed, no chemical residues are allowed in that fabric. Um, and of course, everyone has you know, different levels of sensitivity, but you, know, you may know someone, I, I certainly know people that are very um, sensitive to these kinds of chemicals and there are people that have to be very careful about what they wear. But even if you don't have these kinds of sensitivities, um, even if you don't see um, that your body is, is kind of uh, absorbing these toxins, nevertheless, um, if there are chemicals in these, in these fabrics, um, that is going on your skin. So we can really start to see that by making these changes to our supply chain, it's, you know, the benefits are, you know, beyond uh, the kind of, uh, they're, they're worth making the changes because the benefits are so great, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> All right, so um bringing it back to a kind of broader lens um you know what we've been discussing now is really the impact of fashion design on the environment right we've been exploring it through a t-shirt but that's the bigger issue we're talking about here and what i want to just point out is that um a lot of uh kind of um I, i'd say un unvalidated maybe not things that haven't been researched with depth um they might write a kind of fake fact like this, which is that the global fashion industry is the second most polluting industry in the world. Now, I just want to clarify that that is not the case. Uh, we don't know that for sure. It's not um, research driven. Um, but that doesn't mean that the fashion industry is not causing a lot of harm because fashion is one of the most resource intensive industries in the world. And this is both in terms of natural resources and human resources. So I just think it's really important to make sure that we're using the right facts when we're talking about um, the impact of fashion design on the environment. What I think is really important um, for us, certainly for those of you that are thinking about studying design and, and for myself as a designer, is actually this amazing responsibility that you have. Because the Danish Fashion Institute, through their research, found that up to 80% of a garment's environmental impact is defined by choices made in the design process. And of course, thinking about what we've explored so far today, the fact that, you know, as a designer, you can decide what fiber you use. So if you decide to use organic cotton rather than conventional cotton, you know you're making an impact right in terms of the environment in terms of the social issues in terms of what it's going to be like for your customer at the end wearing that t-shirt so um, what's really exciting i think is that um, right now as we study design and as we explore design we can really start to think about ourselves as designers as having a real responsibility because the choices we make do mean something it's not just about aesthetics there's so much more uh, impact that we can have as designers through the choices we make and this is where we're starting to see this whole realm of design activism coming through. Um, and I think that's why it's a really exciting time to be a designer, because we can use design as a medium, not only to create beautiful things, we can actually use it as a medium to ask questions or maybe even to affect change. Um, and so, for example, we're coming back again now to Vivian Westwood, you know, we're coming full circle because Vivian Westwood now says that climate change, not fashion, is her priority. And here you can see her um, wearing her climate revolution uh, t-shirt at uh, one of her fashion shows. Um, and, you know, what's really interesting is slogan t-shirts um, are being used very much so within this kind of uh, design activism realm. Um, this is um, an example of a collaboration um, done between Henry Holland and Britta. And here they're trying to encourage people to stop using um, single-use plastic um, through this t-shirt design. Um, here you can see at New York Fashion Week, again, using uh, the kind of mode of a slogan t-shirt um, to ask questions, to raise awareness of issues, of things that are going on in the world. So, you know, 
here we're really reminded of the power of fashion as a medium of communication. Um, it is so much more than just wearing clothes. Um, and I think this is also something that's quite interesting um, linked to this idea around design activism. Um, this is a group in the UK called Extinction Rebellion, and they've been actually holding protests at London Fashion Week. This is just an example of one, but they've been doing it every season, the last couple of seasons. Um, and they're really asking questions um, about the fashion industry and they're asking the fashion industry to reflect on the way that they produce things. And so, of course, that means that us as designers have to think differently about the way that we produce garments. And so this is what I would like each of you uh, to do today. Um, I want you to think as a design activist. All right. And I want you to think about um what matters to you um i want you to think about the things that you might want to raise awareness of um you know what are the things that you would like to change in the world uh it doesn't have to just be fashion um you might want to change something else about the world and i want you to Think about how you can use um, fashion uh, as a medium to be able to ask these kind of questions, but very specifically today, a t-shirt, um, designing a slogan t-shirt. Now, I'm gonna give you a link to a website um, where you can do your t-shirt design. I'm really sorry, for some reason my... Um, da -da 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 -da. For some reason my my chat has gone a bit funny so give me one second because i'm going to give you a link to a website that's going to make it very very easy um, for you to do a t-shirt design um, so what i want you to do is go to this website and um let me see if i can make this work i'm so sorry i don't know why my i uh <laughs> full disclosure i'm much more used to using teams than i am to using zoom Okay, that's only gone privately to one person. Okay. Um, ah, hang on, here we go. Got it now. All right, so I'm giving you a link to a website. I want you to go to this website. It's really, really easy, and you get to have a little go at basically creating a t-shirt design. There's actually loads of different websites that you can do this on. This is just one example. Um, and when you go to this website, you'll basically have a picture of a t-shirt and then you can add um, your text. You can change the font of your text. You can change the color. You can also do your design on the front or the back of the t-shirt, completely up to you. Um, but what I would like to do is create your own slogan t-shirt as a design activist. Um, and then you can just take a screenshot of it um, and then um, you can email me your designs and then what I'm going to do is um, come back and then we can share some of those designs um, and have a little explore and, um, and see what you all care about and what you're all passionate about. So I'm going to give you about 15 minutes um, to do that. So we're about just, just past 12 now. So, you know what, why don't we just say, hmm, should we just say um, 12.25, is that all right with everyone? If you try and get your t-shirt finished um, by 12.25 and email it to me. And that means that by about 12.30, I can start showing some of these uh, designs. Now, do you guys have any questions? Let me just have a quick look. I just want to, yeah, just one t-shirt design so you can, and it's up to you. You might say, oh, I want it to be on the front or I want it to be on the back, depending on, on your idea, completely free. But, and you know, again, there is no right or wrong with this. Um, the whole point of this, of today's workshop is to give you, as I was saying, a bit of a taster of what we do within fashion design at DIDI. Um, but this gives you a little chance to come up with your own idea. Um, and, you know, you might just want to ask a question on your t-shirt 
or you might want to make some kind of statement or you might want to say something you know think about some of the little examples we looked at um but imagine this t-shirt as a canvas um for you to raise awareness ask a question inspire someone to think differently and, and this is very much about you. And I think this is so crucial, and this is something that I really focus on with my students, is ultimately, um, it's about you as a designer, all right? So what do you care about? What are you passionate about? Because that is what would drive you as a design student, you know? Um, it's not about what anyone else thinks, not about what someone else thinks you should care about or you should do. This is about what, what you care about. Um, and yeah, you can, um, you know, I, I'm, to make it simple, I'm giving you this, um, and this idea of a slogan t-shirt so that you can, as I said, you can follow this link and you can just um, put text on a t-shirt. Um, but if you, um, if you uh, want to put some kind of image on it, um, you, can, you can do that too and you can change the color of the t-shirt. Um, Okay, lots of questions coming. Okay, this is good. Um, does it have to be a slogan t-shirt? Um, I guess not necessarily, um, but the idea is to think about what we've explored about t-shirts, right? We thought about t-shirts being um, a kind of uh, associated with rebellion, associated with asking questions. Um, and so that's our kind of theme for today. Um, and so, yes, if you can, but, you know, I would say a slogan t-shirt um, is quite a broad kind of concept. So, you know, you could also have some kind of image that could be asking a question. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you write loads of words. Um, can it be on anything? Now, do you mean like not on a t-shirt? <laughs> But that's fine. I'm really open. As I said, there's no right or wrong. If you have some other reason, I know on that website, I think you can also design like um, a hat or you can also uh, put a slogan like on a tote bag. So, okay, on the top, no, the topic. Okay, yeah, of course, it's whatever you care about. In terms, but yeah, as I said, you can also design a tote bag if that's important to you. Uh, but ideally a t-shirt. And the topic can be, yeah, whatever you, whatever you care about. So, I mean, previously when I've done this task, um, I've had students maybe that um, are really, uh, I don't know, curious about kind of um, body image issues. And so, you know, maybe they've done something around acceptance um, and people being accepted for who they are and how they are and not having to be under pressure to change the way they look. Um, okay. Um, so you guys are going to have to have a little explore on that website. I think if you want to put an image, um, onto that t-shirt, you're probably going to have to have a JPEG and you're going to have to upload it, um, into that t-shirt. Um, if you guys, um, have used like Photoshop or anything like that, you could also do it in Photoshop if you want. Um, the link I've given you is just a really simple one in terms of the fact that you get a body with a t-shirt. And it allows you to just put text directly and also move it around. And then you can just do a very quick screen grab. Um, and that's why I'm giving you kind of at least 15 minutes so that um, I think we'll start the 15 minutes maybe a little bit later because I don't think anyone's, I'm not sure if anyone's started yet. Are there any other um, burning questions? Before I give you a bit of time, maybe we'll, you know what, I'm going to give you a little bit of extra time. Why don't we just say, let's have 12.30, okay? So I'm going to give you about 20 minutes so that you can have a play on that website and have a little play with the functionality. And then you also get a little bit of an experience of um, getting your head around that. But let me have a quick look if I can, um, let's see, what about if I stop sharing for a second? And let me see if I do, 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 do. Let me see if it will help you guys if I actually show you. I know for some of you, if you've never, um, if you've never used um, a program like this link I've sent you, you might not be familiar with using it. So I can also um, do a little demonstration on here. Let me just get the website up and then I'll um, do, all right.
So if I come back and share my screen, oh, a few more questions, let me see. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, if you would like to do two t-shirts, that's absolutely fine. Um, right, I can see lots of questions coming through, so I'm going to look at those in one second, I promise. Let me just share my screen and just make sure you guys are all really clear on this. So, is this working? Okay, so here, whoops, right, hopefully you can see this, and now... We're going to start designing. So you get to the point where you pick your t-shirt and then we're going to start designing the t-shirt. So just to give you a very quick demo. All right, so you should get to a page like this. Get rid of that. And so we have, you know, our plain t-shirt here. You can do the front, you can do the back, and then I'm going to add some text. And here maybe I'm going to add some question marks. I'm going to add that to my design and then I can move this here in the center. I can also rotate it. Um, I can change the shape. Here I can play about with the bulge. Okay. Um, I can also make the text bigger. All right, um, what else can we do here? So you have some different options that you can play about with. And then if you want to add your own image, you would click upload and then you can drag and drop an image. So if you have an image from the internet that you want to add in, you could do that there. You could also be adding um, some other artwork. And here you can see actually within this program, it also offers you here online some different artwork. Work. So you select you can can see my computer's having a hard time. Oh. Still here. <laughs> I think I've frozen. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I am back. I'm sorry. My that that just killed my laptop. Just <laughs> trying to show you that. So. <clears throat> Hello everyone, I hope you are all um, able to keep going with your t-shirt designs. Um, yes, let me give you my email address in here because it's not on the screen anymore. Okay, so I've just popped that in the chat. Um, And then I'm so sorry that, you know, um, because I got, <laughs> because of my computer issues today, <clears throat> um, all the previous chat, and I know there were other questions, um, which I hadn't answered yet because they were sort of more general questions about um, fashion design um, as a whole, um, which I'm very happy to answer kind of at the end of this session. Um, so those of you um, that were kind of sending me the, the private chat questions, um, if you can, can you just um, copy and paste them back in, just send them again so that I'll get them in the chat now. And then what I'll do is answer all those questions that are more general about kind of fashion design as a career, um, you know, studying fashion design at DIDI, um, all those kind of more general questions. Um, I'll have time, I'll, there's time at the end of, um, of today uh, session to, to do that specifically to, to talk about those questions. So I will do that. Okay. So 
just resend me those questions and um, and if you guys have any other questions um, about today's session you can also start popping those in um, I'm getting a few emails um, coming through which is lovely so let me um, oh. <laughs> oh guys my computer is just going mad today so I hope I'm still with you okay um, okay here we go I have a little Okay, I have one, two, up. Oh, I've got quite a few designs here from Risha. That's cool. Okay. Um, all right. So let me um, open these up. And nice. And maybe. Um, Maybe if anyone wants to tell us a bit about what they've done. Um, and yeah, if you don't mind just doing um, a screen grab and actually sending the attachment of the screen grab because the last time I went to that website, it kind of killed my computer. <laughs> um, so I'm a bit scared of touching this website now. Um, ah, interesting. Okay, so let me see if I can start showing some of these because we're starting I'm starting to get some designs through I'm just trying to open them up um, and then I'll get a few open up and then we'll uh, all this one's like within the message okay hang on a second um, one second right great I'm getting some more t-shirts through so I'm going to show you guys some of these in one second let me get a few more open Eight, another one. It's so nice. All right. Um, okay. Um, so let's just have a little look at the t-shirts we have so far and then I'm going to do your more general questions about studying uh, fashion design etc. So keep popping any of those questions that you have in. All right, um, let me share my screen again and let's have a look at some of these, um, some of these designs. All right. Um, so here we have a really nice, um, simple, design here that just says the word together. Um, I wonder if the um, the person that created this one, would you like to tell us um, what your inspiration, what your thinking was for this design? Actually, that's the back of the design. Ah, okay. So should I show, I think I've got the other side here as well. Hang on one second. Let me This one, yeah. I just thought both of them went together well because, like, now everyone's um, on Black Lives Matter. So then I just thought a black background and then a white would just would just go simple. Yeah. No. Great. And I mean, really important. And it's really, um, it's really exactly what. Um, the themes that we've been exploring today are all about, right? It's really thinking about what's going on in the world, um, what can we do to make the world a better place, how can we use, you know, fashion design as a medium for that, right? And, and a t-shirt as a kind of canvas to, to encourage people to ask questions and think differently. So that's great. Thank you. All right. Um, let me share another one here. Uh, here we go. Okay, um, now this t-shirt says, um, I don't know how clearly you guys can see it, but it says, don't be greedy, it's time to be greeny. <laughs> so very cool, very much around design activism. So that's great, thank you. Um, and then I have another one here. Let's show you guys this one. This is rather lovely as well. 
accept yourself. Um, and as I show these, if anyone really wants to, um, you know, tell us a bit more about what they're thinking is, please do do just pipe up and say. Uh, but equally, you'd rather not. So you can let your T-shirt speak for you. Um, that's very lovely as well. Okay. Um, up. And then let's see what else can I show you here. I've got a few more emails coming through. So let me um, let me get those open and show you some more. Do, do, do. Right. Here we go. Have another design come through. Okay, so okay. <laughs> Some of you are sending me links. Are you trying to kill my computer? <laughs> All right. Um, ah, okay. All right, hang on. Let's show let's see if I can show a few more and then I think we'll do questions. So all right, um, let me share my screen again. Up. Okay. Up. Okay, so here we have another design that's come through, which is all about the summer. Well, I wonder if you are here with us in the uh, in Dubai, is this Dubai summer specific? <laughs> um, and then let's see, I've got another one to show you. Huh, hang on a second. Where's the next one that I wanted to show you? But I'm really excited to see so many coming through. Okay. Up. See, I really wish they would invent a smoother way to be able to do this on Zoom. <laughs> ah, here we go. So another one about loving yourself, which I think is quite nice as well. These are very, very important current issues, things to be thinking about. So thank you. All right. So um, I think what I'm going to do now is um, kind of deal with all our other kinds of um, questions because there seem to be a lot of questions um, about fashion in general um, and about studying fashion. Um, so I want to um, I want to deal with those while we have the time but um, I promise I am going to uh, have a look at all your t-shirt designs and I'm really interested um, to see that. Um, so why don't we um, do a few questions um, about studying um, fashion in general. Um, so I saw there was a question earlier on. Um, where is it here? Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. So, okay, I have a question here about um, sewing skills. Um, now, you know, of course, uh, I have to say it's very important um, if you want to be uh, a fashion designer, um, it's very important to, um, to know how things are made. But of course, you're not necessarily going to be um, the person who makes those garments. Um, that's really up to you. Um, as part of your studies um, at DIDI, if you are studying fashion design, you will learn how things are made. Um, so we do learn um, sewing, uh, we do learn how to you know, construct a garment, um, how to go right from the sort of sketch through to uh, selecting the fabric, uh, through to pattern cutting, um, which is actually um, finding what are the shapes that we need to cut out in the fabric to be able to construct this garment. And then you will also learn how to construct the garment. Um, 
but you are supported through that. Uh, you learn how to do that. And I wouldn't say that our focus is purely, uh, say, on those practical skills. They're part of what you learn. So I don't think it's something at all to worry about or to hold you back. If you feel, you know, that you've never done any sewing before, well, that's absolutely fine. Uh, the majority of our students have never done any sewing before and we start from scratch and, and you will you will learn um, and you will learn enough to be able to realize your designs but nevertheless you know you as a designer your focus is on the the conceptual the theory the the reason you know why are you designing something what's the point uh, what value does it create that that's the most important part um, but when we really start getting into, you know, more complex garments, so, you know, not a t-shirt, you know, once you start thinking about dresses and uh, jackets and trousers, you know, the construction becomes more complicated and it is really important for you as a designer to understand the differences and the different considerations, um, for designing those different garments. And that is why we do learn the basics of kind of, you know, sewing and making, um, and garment construction, um, within your, um, within your studies. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think um, that's great that so many of you are really interested in studying fashion design. Um, so I really encourage you to, um, you know, explore the information that we, we have online um, about fashion design. You can also have a look at um, the exhibition website that we created um, at the end of last semester. Um, so I'm gonna pop that link in here because what you can see there is examples of our student work. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, you can actually have a look at this website, which is didiexhibition.com. Um, and here you can see examples of student work from the foundation, which is what you do for the first year. And then you can see examples from all four concentrations. So you can see examples from fashion design. You can see examples from strategic design management, from multimedia and from product design. Um, and all our students do two concentrations. So the students actually move between them. Um, so you'll see there are lots of different approaches, um, for example, even within fashion, um, there are lots of different ideas that are being explored and different ways that um, designers are expressing themselves. Um, so it's really broad. Um, okay, let's see, are there any other questions in general about, um, about uh, studying fashion or about studying fashion at DIDI. Do you guys have any questions about that? We have a little bit of time for that now. No? Okay, all right. Well, I'll just leave a little bit of space. Let me... Um, have a look at some more of your designs then while we have this time, which is nice. Um, okay, interesting. Okay. Are you guys having a look at each other's links here in the chat? I know some of you are sharing links. Mama, I've sent you a mail. Of my Hello, sorry? I have sent you a mail of my design. Okay. Let me go back into there. Okay. Oh, I've got lots of emails now. All right, great. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll be honest. So uh, let's see, we have a lot here. So let me get, um, let me get them into a format that I can then share a few. Up and then okay, so there's there. one second. I'm just having to do a little bit of drag and drop, and I would rather get um, a few open and then we can look at them together. Okay. Okay. Up. Oh. 
Right, I'm really sorry, guys. My, as you know, we've already had, I've already had a few computer issues and my computer is not very happy today. So I'm being a little bit cautious and just taking it slow so that the computer doesn't go on strike on me again. Okay. Um, Hello, Ms. Noren. Yes. Hey, how are you, Ms. Noren? It's me, your student. Hello. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just want to double check if you just have my um, the email with you, if if it's if it's with you right now, it's popped up in your screen. Can I just know, please? What's your uh, email address? It's hturk twenty two x at gmail dot com. Hmm. I'm not sure I do have that actually. Do you want to maybe resend it just in case? Yes, yeah, I'll resend it right now. Great. <laughs> okay. All right. So let me um, let me share a few more because um, there's some more interesting designs coming through. So here. Um, Rather beautiful, very simple, um, but of course very current um, because of what's going on right now. So thank you for that one. Um, very much answering the brief today and in the right uh, mind frame. So very cool. Thank you. All right. And then I have another one to show you here. Can you guys see that one now? All right, so very colorful and um, maybe a little bit feminist inspired. Very nice, thank you very much. Okay, um, let's have a look at a few more. Here we have another Another designer raising awareness of, of Black Lives Matter. Very, very important, uh, very current. Um, and again, I would say that this is uh, so important um, for all of us designer, as designers, but um, very much as fashion designers. You know, fashion is always responding to what's going on in the world. Um, you know, we don't exist in a bubble. We have to know what's going on in the world and we have to be aware of it. And often it can be real fuel for our inspiration and for our creative work. Okay, so let me check a few more emails and then do let me know if you have any last minute questions before we kind of draw our session to a close today. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there's some of you guys I know who sent me links and those are taking a little bit longer to show themselves. Okay, all right, now let me share this one. Um, oh, and one more here. Okay. Um, Okay, here, so we have another design to share with you. Oops. Here, yeah. just rather lovely. Be the exception. <laughs> Encouraging us to be different and think differently. Very nice. Okay, so um are there any last questions um about studying fashion or about studying at didi that i can help you with today um please do go ahead and ask um obviously you have uh, my email address from today's session um, i'm sorry i didn't um show everybody's designs um 
unfortunately my computer is not feeling very happy today so straight after the session i'm gonna be giving it some very much needed tlc um okay that's an interesting question so there is a question that's come up in the chat um what do you have to study to get in fashion now i wonder what you mean by that question do you mean to get into say didi to study fashion or do you mean is there only one <clears throat> one thing that you can study if you want to end up working in fashion later because that, that's kind of two different questions and i'm not quite clear from what you've written there which one you mean um <clears throat> it's a question is about what you need to be able to come study fashion at didi well that would be something that you can um speak to um Razan about um because there are i think a few specifications in terms of um grades and things that you need but otherwise you don't need to have a portfolio or anything like that before you join what do we yeah have so i can i can answer that um so for if anyone's interesting in, interested in applying to didi uh all we need is your high school grades and then we need either an ielts or toefl exam um and uh, just a passion for design. So uh, we don't require any students to take any fashion or, or design or art courses previous to them joining the idea. We teach you everything from scratch. And if you have that experience, that's great. Uh, it'll make it uh, easier for your journey um, at the idea. So yeah, and we, our portfolio is also optional. So if you have one, that's great. If not, do not worry about it. So we don't want to limit anyone uh, who's interested in studying design. Great. Um, but of course, you know, um, there are people that work in fashion that, that didn't study fashion at all. Um, there's all different kinds of journeys to end up in, you know, that you can do to end up in fashion. Um, but I really do, uh, I don't know, I, I, recommend, um, I recommend studying fashion because there is so much to learn. And, and even, you know, for me as a practitioner, you know, I've been uh, working in this industry for such a long time and I'm still learning new things all the time. So it's not even like you'll do your degree and then you'll know everything, you know, you'll, you'll be at the beginning of a really exciting journey and then you will always be learning. As designers, we are constantly learning, it, it never ends. Um, oh, I'm so glad that uh, you enjoyed the session, um, Marianne. Thank you very much for your feedback. That's lovely. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone um, today for joining us and, and for taking part. And thank you for sharing um, your t-shirt ideas. I'm going to um, carry on, carry on uh, today looking through those. Um, and yeah feel free um obviously to get in touch with myself if you have really specific questions um about how we teach fashion at didi or, or what we do within that um as i said explore our exhibition website you get a bit of a taster there and um and razan obviously can, can deal with any other questions about the application process um but yeah great so I think we're going to draw this to a close. Um, so I'm going to hand back, I guess, to Rosanna. I don't know whatever, what last things might be needed. But thank you so much for your engagement today. Um, and I hope that I will get to meet you sometime um, at DIDI in person. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Noreen, for the really uh, awesome workshop. And uh, have a great day, everyone. And any questions, anything you want to know, you can reach out to either myself or Noreen. Hope we hope to see you in our future events, so stay tuned. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more programming once our semester begins. Have a lovely day.